Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another Classical Conversation. We're looking forward to our next program with Maestro Giancarlo Guerrero. Joyce Yang plays Grieg. Good afternoon, Giancarlo. Hi, Jez. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Well, let's dive right in. Right off the top, this program opens with Night on Bald Mountain. You've spoken a couple times recently about knowing some great music from cartoons, and I think this is definitely one of those and more. Yes, and uh, well, most people will recognize this tune because of Fantasia, the original Fantasia from the 1930s. And uh, this was actually the opening tune that was used with Stokowski conducting the Philadelphia Orchestra. But interestingly enough, this is really the first Russian tone poem from 1868. And Mussorgsky was part of a group of Russian composers known as the Russian Five. And the three most famous of the five are Mussorgsky, Rimsky-Korsakov, and Borodin. The other two are Mili Balakirev and Cesar Kui. And the thing about these five composers is that none of them were really professional musicians. They really had other jobs and they composed kind of on the side. Rimsky-Korsakov was a naval officer and Mussorgsky was a lawyer by training, but they loved music and they loved to compose. And the unusual thing with Mussorgsky is that for some reason, all of his other colleagues seemed to feel, feel that he wasn't really up to the task and he always needed help with his music. So most of the music that we hear of Mussorgsky is actually arranged or orchestrated by somebody else. The most famous case, of course, pictures at an exhibition, which Mussorgsky wrote originally for piano and then later made into the more famous version for orchestra done by Maurice Ravel. And this version of Night on Bald Mountain, although Mussorgsky did a version himself of this tone poem, Rimsky-Korsakov, his friends, felt that it needed a little help. And that is the version that was not only done in Fantasia, but really 99% of the times is the one that gets done. And the reason is because I think it is not quite as dark as the original one. This one, I think, gives you the whole idea of this tone poem, which is based on a witch's Sabbath. Uh, the actual name of the piece is uh, A Night on Bald Mountain, a St. John's Eve, which is the beginning of the summer solstice. And it is a very dark piece that kind of gives you this idea of this witch's Sabbath, this, this whole celebration of a black mass with very uh, scary and grotesque tunes. But there's also some happy tunes. The piece actually ends at dawn with this bell kind of ringing on the far away and all of the evil spirits kind of going away uh, for the day. And Rivki Korsakov, what he did was basically grab some of the most uh, popular tunes that Mussorgsky had used and turned them into this more, I think, a complete tone point which lasts about 12 minutes and gives you a better idea of the piece. Uh, for those of you who may want to do some homework, you may want to check out the original Mussorgsky version and maybe for some of you, maybe your favorite. For me, I prefer the Rimsky-Korsakov just because it's the better known one and it is a lot of fun to play with the orchestra, but it is really virtuosic, really um, uh, showcases a lot of the virtuosity in the orchestra, a lot of colors. And as I said, at a time when the symphonies were kind of kings, the idea of a new tone poem, just writing music that tells a story, but without having to use any words or any singers was still quite unusual in the mid part of the 19th century. And Mussorgsky, unfortunately, also was not very good kind of leading his own personal life. He was an alcoholic. He actually died at 42 from alcoholism, which is kind of sad. He always did not look very good. But of course, he was an immensely, immensely uh, talented composer. And this is one of those pieces, I think, puts him in the great pantheon of, of great Russian composers. Yeah, definitely. And I think even without many of us being able to visualize Fantasia, it is such an incredible musical journey and conjures such great um, pictures in our heads. So I can't wait to, to share that with everyone. Um, well, you know, he had friends who wanted to help orchestrate and we have a great friend and Joy Shang who are very glad to have actually joining us today to talk about the Grieg. And I did a quick search this morning, Joyce, and I found that this will be your sixth performance with the Nashville Symphony and your third here with Giancarlo. Um, so we're so glad to welcome you back and I look forward to hearing from you both about, about the piano concerto that you're going to play. Thank you. Hi, I'm so excited to be playing one of, really one of my favorite piano concerti here. And um, what a return. It's uh, Well, it is a great joy to, to bring you back to Nashville. And uh, one of the great uh, things is, you know, about making music is that we get to collaborate with our friends. And in your case, I mean, you're now a wonderful welcome guest in Nashville, and we all can't wait to, to make music with you. So let's talk about the Grieg. I mean, uh, is this a piece that you have done many times over your career? 
This is a piece that uh, I learned as a teenager uh, when I was uh, in Juilliard pre-college program, which is a Saturday school. It was one of the competition pieces, but not in my age group, um, those that were older. And of course I wanted to, to learn it too and to be part of the party. And so I learned it then, and, um, but I think it was maybe uh, 15 years later or something like that, that I uh, played it for uh, the first time, maybe 10 years later. And since then, I think I've, I've played uh, pretty much a couple of times each season and it, it has transformed, you know, in the beginning, you get very indulgent. There's so many beautiful melodies and you just, um, you zone out a little bit and try to add so much to it and over the years you try to simplify a little bit and all you have to do is just illuminate these beautiful transparent melodies that remind us of beautiful um, nature and Norwegian landscape and you really hear the um, sounds of water sounds of birds and I think um, and icicle sounds as well um, snowy mountains and I hope really everyone yeah goes on a journey and um, goes to their favorite place <laughs> when they listen to it. Well, interestingly enough, this concerto was written on the same year as the Night on Bald Mountain, which is opening the program. Interestingly enough, it's just a coincidence. And what's also more interesting is that Grieg, in many ways, was not very comfortable writing large orchestral pieces. I mean, he just wrote, uh, you know, this piano concerto, of course, being his main work. I mean, he wrote the incidental music to Pierre Gint, which I think is his other world famous piece. But actually, when he was 15 years old, he moved to Leipzig to study in the place where Bach and Schumann and Mendelssohn kind of did their training. So in many ways, he had a lot of that Germanic, Central European training, but he could not escape his Norwegian DNA. In many ways, I think of him as Sibelius being the great Norwegian nationalistic composer. And in many ways, to this day, he is a national hero in Norway, of course. And this piano concert, of course, being, you know, the, the big one of them all. And uh, he was not himself a great pianist, and he dedicated to the person who uh, uh, premiered it, Edmund uh, Lippert. And uh, I wanted to ask your opinion about the actual piano writing, whether it is very idiomatic or is there, are there things that are a little bit out there? For the pianists, I mean, for a piece that was written at a time when Liszt and all the great pianists were kind of ruling the world in Europe. I think there are uh, just small pockets of very orchestral sound that he writes for the piano. That is, um, you have to think about more of what he was imagining than trying to nail every single note. Um, I'm talking about the big arpeggio that um, shocks everybody at the start of the third movement. And that's... Um, that sweep across the piano is incredibly um, awkward in many ways, but you have to think it's like, that's when, you know, everyone is dreaming at the end of the second movement, falling out of time and then big shocking um, two hands together, but displaced a little bit um, going up in probably 0 0.01 seconds um, across <laughs> the keyboard. And that's what starts this, um, this folk dance that is, uh, it's so, um, it's such a great moment, but I think something like that, I think to myself, he probably was not a pianist to be writing something like this. <laughs> so well, I gotta be honest with you, that moment that you're talking about, that big rush of notes, uh, this is how I conduct it. Just close my eyes and just hope for the best and hope to land with you. I mean, this is one of those, <laughs> that there's nothing much that you can do other than just to feel where to land, because once you get going, it's just this rush of sound, but we do have to finish, you know, together. Otherwise, it, it sounds a little weird. Uh, you have done the piece many times. I personally, like I told you before, I've only done the piece once, which is kind of interesting because this may be perhaps one of the most performed piano concertos, but it doesn't come around for conductors as often. And the last time I did it was maybe eight or nine years ago. So I actually had to get a new score just to remind myself how the piece goes. But with the fact that the piece is so often played, I mean, you mentioned that you've had kind of your own journey since you learned it as a teenager and now playing it. Uh, this time in your life. Um, how dangerous is it for you to approach a piece that it is so well known, not only by orchestras and conductors, but more importantly by audiences? How do you keep it fresh? Well, I try to pretend like Greg just wrote it for me and I'm premiering it for the first time. That's sort of how I take the pressure off because I know, um, yeah, this is really many people's uh, they're looking for their favorite moment in the concert. And, you know, there's that fear that if it's different, then you would either say, oh my gosh, it's 10 times better or say, oh, I, I hate it so much. So this is not like the recording I have at home. This is not like my recording, what happened? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so I, I think um, I try to actually revisit the score that's very important with a really 
old piece because old yeah, habits. I have my new score. I have my brand new score. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you have to just make sure you're not doing anything that just seems like it's in the score, but you've made it up in your mind along the way. So you go back like, you know, like a student again and really um, look at it. And um, and but I think but it does help that um, through collaborations, I, I noticed that, you know, there's that little breath there that doesn't quite work. So we have to do something about that. There are little pockets that I've experimented along the way. And I think timing is very important in this piece because it, it shows up kind of like, like a series of little, little fables. There is a little bit of this, um, this uh, almost like short story, uh, far, far away kind of once upon a time kind of feeling. And mm -hmm. It, it, I think if I'm not, uh, if I indulge too much, then it becomes like a series of short stories that have nothing to do with each other. So I think joints in between the melodies and things like that are um, what really holds these um, these moments together. And um, certain certain journeys just uh, need to be unfolded, just like telling a story rather than becoming the character and not being able to escape that world. So it's it's little things I've learned along the way, but um, I try to play it like I've never played it before. And I'm sure with Giancarlo, it'll be <laughs> a brand new well, journey. You and, I, you and I have worked many times and we were just talking also that right before the, our last collaboration was actually in Sao Paulo in Brazil, doing the Prokofiev third. And one thing that I enjoy with our collaborations is that nothing is out of bounds and that we have ample rehearsal time that we can actually experiment. And I do enjoy that even with a piece that is so well known, we actually take the time to try out new things and some of them work out and and some of them you kind of feel the orchestra go like what was that and uh, and i think that's the joy of music i mean you don't want things to be the same all the time and even within the same week and within one rehearsal to the next things can change and that's always welcome and you appreciate that adventure uh because uh, and a big part of it is i think is the chemistry that you and i have had over the years that we're not afraid to push the envelope and like you said looking at the score deeply uh, Grieg was very specific about what he wanted. I mean, over the years, the fact that the piece gets played so often, you know, bad habits do creep up and people start doing things that are that really have nothing to do with what Grieg requested. And then when you go back and you look at exactly what he wrote, you said, but hang on a second, he really knew what he wanted and why don't we try it the way that it is? And all of a sudden it's like you discover oil. It's like, oh my God, it works even better than all of these other baggage that we've been hearing over many years. But uh, the only way you can do that is by experimenting. Yeah, I I always enjoy like our three performances that, you know, go on a journey in itself during the week. And uh, it just, uh, you always teach me something new about the concerti that I think I know so well. Like last time I remember Prophet Third, you were point, pointing out a number of things for me. And I was like, oh my gosh, if I knew this a long time ago, I would have applied all these things. So I can't wait to see what... <laughs> That's the joy of music. And I cannot, you know, mention the Greek without, of course, mentioning the inspiration behind this concerto, of course, which is the Schumann piano concerto, which was Grieg's favorite piece of all time. He actually heard Clara Schumann, Robert Schumann's widow, play the piece live. And in many ways, this piece is the companion piece to the to, to the Schumann. It's not uh, really based on it, but the structure is pretty much the same. Like the Schumann, it is in the same key in A minor. And like the Schumann, it begins with this big flare of the piano's descending scale right off the top, which, as you call, is very shocking. And then the woodwinds, like the Schumann, take over the main melody. I mean, there are so many similarities to the structure of this. Uh, then the second movement becomes very, very short. Uh, very much like the Schumann concerto, almost like an interlude before you hit the very virtuosic last movement, which goes without a break also, just like like that. Uh, so I think that in many ways, people say that, you know, uh, imitation is the greatest source of flattery. And Grieg was not afraid to ex admit the fact that, yes, this piece in many ways is inspired by the Schumann. Are there any similarities in the piano writing as well? They feel just pianistically very different. Um, mm -hmm. Well, Schumann I, was a pianist himself, a great pianist. That's the difference, I think. Right. Uh, I think uh, the, the beginning, as you put it, it does feel similar. It's just, um, I have about three seconds before, uh, as soon as the piece takes off, that I have to, uh, you know, jump off the I have to make sure you're ready before <laughs> I start. I mean, that's one of the greatest dangers. I mean, you may still be adjusting your bench or something, and they say, excuse me, I'm not quite there. At least with the Greek, you get a whole timpani roll, so he can hold it as long as until you're ready. 
Yes, I. It, it is a very thrilling. As as I'm walking out the stage, I'm already thinking about that first cascading um, mm -hmm. and ar arpeggio octaves, and it's it's uh, it's such a high. After that, you don't know how. Uh, <laughs> the heart is beating so fast and that that is the same um yeah the feeling in the in the in the Schumann and worst of all everybody knows that opening that's the other <laughs> <Yeah>. thing <laughs> and then the, and then of course it goes to that that initial melody that is small and and, intimate. and so poetic so intimate. yeah yeah but then your heart is still pounding from what yeah. happened just just seconds before and um but uh but Greek to me is 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 almost like I have to very often mimic the woodwinds, mimic you know, mimic the the strings, and it's it's very interwoven um, uh, delicately in a way. It's it's it never gets thick where piano feels the need to project or something. It's everything's transparent, and we're just um, taking the line and responding to each other. And in that way, I guess. Um, yeah, Schumann also is very delicate and it's interwoven like, you know, perfectly, like the, all the threads need to be just right for it to feel organic. You know, it, it can feel like you're listening to the same thing a couple times over and over if it's not 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 woven just right. So in that way, it, they're both um, quite, quite delicate in my mind. Yeah. Well, Grieg was only 25 when he wrote this. So he was very young <laughs> and he still had a lot of that Leipzig Germanic training and the first two movements are very classical in that regard but uh, his Norwegian DNA really kicks up on the third movement that's when he said no I'm going back to my roots and that's when you hear a lot of that wonderful folksy melodies uh, that are very specific to Norway uh, and it's so fantastic the combination and, and, and as I said for the audiences this I can see why this has become one of the most beloved piano concertos. Yeah, there are so many beautiful uh, things to see. It's like if, if we were in like a tour bus or something, it would be constantly like, yeah. look to the right, look to the left. Yeah. Oh, no, don't don't forget about this. It's like a constant, beautiful things rolling out one after another. So it's a it's a very active, I think, journey for all. And it's you never are in this um, land where you say, what's happening now? Grieg is constantly pulling your hand through all of his little different worlds. And they're just, yeah, they're all beautiful. And I hope. Yeah. <laughs> well, you just called it perfectly. It's going to be a journey. And I cannot wait to share the stage with you with this wonderful concerto. And I'm sure it's going to be one of many, many more collaborations in the future. And we're so grateful that you're coming to Nashville and that we're getting to make music together again. Thank you so much. I so look forward to it and can't wait to see you. Can't wait see to you see soon, you Joyce. See you next time. <laughs> oh, what an exciting piece and a great person to be working with again. Um, so this program closes with an absolutely incredibly exciting visceral piece of Shostakovich's, um, which there's so much to say about the symphony number no. five. But Giancarlo, I feel like we must also recall that you have set us up for the context, the history of this piece by doing the fourth symphony in late 2019 and knowing that in addition to just what this piece is in its own isolated moment is so exciting too. So I hope you'll share a little bit about how that, that fits as you talk a little bit about what this piece means to you and what we're gonna hear next week. Well, of Chostakovich's 15 symphonies altogether, this is by far the most popular. And I would say it's probably one of the most popular symphonies of the 20th century. Uh, after Gustav Mahler in the early part of the 20th century, it was Shostakovich who kind of took the mantle of the great symphonist of the 20th century. And, uh, but for Shostakovich, it was not an easy journey because he happened to live at a time uh, in the Soviet Union when it was some of the most difficult years under Stalin, where uh, artists were constantly being brutalized and abused uh, if they did not follow the rules uh, set forth by the state. And uh, Shostakovich was always under that threat and he did know even family members and friends who disappeared into gulags and never to be heard of again and disappeared from history books. And, uh, and he, unlike many of his Russian colleagues who basically through this time left uh, the Soviet Union, you know, Stravinsky and Rachmaninoff and Prokofiev and everybody else, Shostakovich stayed in the Soviet Union all the way until his death in 1975. And uh, so he had an up and down depending on what he was writing. And you mentioned the Fourth Symphony, which we did in 2019, which is actually the reason for the Fifth Symphony. Uh, basically, the, 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 the story is in, in the short version is that he was writing his Fourth Symphony at a time when Shostakovich was the rock star in Russian composition. His opera, Lady Macbeth, was the hottest ticket 
in Moscow. Uh, this opera was so incredibly that you could not get tickets for it. And he was kind of the golden boy, the, the poster child of Russian composition until Stalin went to see the opera. And we do know that at intermission, he left, which is not a good sign. And the next morning on Pravda, which, is, which was the state newspaper, there was a front uh, uh, page uh, story, which was not actually signed. It was uh, an anonymous uh, article that it was, the title was uh, Muddle, Not Music. And it was an incredible direct attack, not only on the opera, Lady Macbeth, calling it completely Western influences and not Soviet by any means, but attacking Shostakovich and basically calling him a spy and somebody that was not touting the, uh, the, the state message. And all of a sudden, overnight, Shostakovich became a wanted man. And in many ways, he actually knew that that was the end of his life, that at some point, some black car would come to his apartment and some agents would come inside and pick him up and he would never be seen again. That was the life that he felt was overnight happened to him. And we do know that around that time, he actually started sleeping on the stairwells in his apartment building because he did not want his family to see the indignity when he came to be picked up, never to be seen again. And the Fifth Symphony is basically a response to get into the good graces of the Soviet state. And this symphony, in many ways, is a revolutionary work. Uh, it begins with the same motif as the Beethoven 9, if you can make the connection. It is also in the same key, which is not an accident. And inside of it, although he was kind of following a more Russian Soviet style of writing, there are a lot of hidden messages in it where he was almost thumbing his nose and saying, you know what, I'm going to write what I want and I'm going to make fun of all this idiocy of communism and Stalinism and, and the craziness of, of living under such a police state. And uh, what's interesting is the piece became such a huge hit that overnight, once again, Shostakovich became a national hero. But the audience understood exactly what he was saying. He became a voice to those quiet voices, millions of people in Russia. What he was saying, it was almost like screaming with your mouth closed like trying to escape and looking for freedom and looking for the, the freedom to write what he wanted. And of course, the Politburo people that attended the concert were there, they were talking, oh, this is so fantastic, it's great Russian music. But the normal people that were there are totally understood what Shostakovich was trying to say underneath. And the famous ending of the symphony, which is so powerful, is uh, basically resembles the idea of what we uh, used to see back in the days in these uh, totalitarian states where you would have somebody speaking at these massive Congress meetings where everybody would be there clapping with big smiles. And God forbid if you are not smiling and clapping because the next day you're going to be dead. So it's for celebration. And you hear this so clearly in his music that, yes, it is a celebration, but it's a celebration under the threat of a gun. And Shostakovich understood this, and his music resembles a very, very dark period in time. The only thing that I can think of nowadays that resembles that is North Korea nowadays when you see that. And you do know that it is not real. All of that is under threat of, of, of death and under threat of, 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 of being disappeared. And over the next uh, decade, Shostakovich would have to live with that. His, his uh, star would go up and down depending on who he was writing and depending on who was in government too. Some people may pay attention and some did not. But in the end, he stuck it. He stuck with it because he loved his country. He adored. He that's why he never left. He was a Russian to the core, and he felt that by writing his music, uh, he could make a bigger impact, and he did. And this Fifth Symphony, many ways, is a turning point because it gives us a snapshot of what it was like to be an artist in Stalinist Russia and still trying to find an original voice. And I think that is the reason that this piece, regardless of when it is played, especially in times like today, uh, when we have political uh, instability all over the world, is a piece that is incredibly relevant. There are moments of great joy, but there's also moments of great fear. And uh, these are things that we can all connect with. And Shostakovich was the perfect voice for it. Yeah, it's a really, still very potent and relevant story and through this piece and the orchestra and you are going to have as you said earlier three really dynamic evenings to explore it and it's different every time and we look forward to that well thank you so much for sharing again about this program uh thank you all for joining us today uh this performance joy shang plays greek will be at the skirmerhorn february 24 25 and 26 you can find tickets more information about this and all of our programs at nashvillesymphony.org